Cool. So for today's session, we're going to cover up like accelerating application delivery using Open Tofu Controller and GitOps on top of Kubernetes. It's a pretty good session because me and Tiago, we have been building um, an architecture pattern about two years ago, and we have been improving it, and we got in the point that we're going to show for you folks today. We're going to have some links after the end of the presentation and everything. I just want to say that before we get started, YAWS supports the technology of our customers and to support those use cases. It's not like mandatory or obligated to use any of those tools. But since we have been supporting customers that have those similar use cases, we found that that could be a good thing to present to you folks. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Tiago. He's going to introduce himself, and then we're going to get started. Thanks, Lucas. It's been a pleasure to be here with you today to talk a little bit more about this cool topic. I'm Thiago Reichert. I've been with AWS for a little bit more than five years right now as a solutions architect. And a quick fun fact about myself is that I actually never had to fool before. So let's impressive. see how this session will go today. Lucas, would you mind introducing yourself as For well? sure. I had to fool in, in the past, but I'm Lucas Duarte. I'm a container specialist, I say, with AWS. I've been in AWS for about almost five years, coming all the way from Brazil, then moving to Texas. Now I'm here. Uh, a cool fun fact about myself is I'm a YouTuber. So I do have a YouTube channel where I show my life being a Brazilian in Texas. If you guys want to follow, that is the YouTube. Well, let's move on to the talk. So when we are talking about platform engineering, we usually think about the two different personas here in the two different roles. We have in one side application development team and another side the infrastructure and operations team. And usually those folks, they have very specific responsibilities assigned to them. When we talk about infrastructure and operations team, we are talking about the folks who are creating the infrastructure, managing the infrastructure, creating the code, provision that for the developers and giving them uh, the data to then put on their application layer. And then in other side, we have the application development team, of course, who's responsible for the application layer, maybe some CI, CD tools and processes, maybe creating our Jenkins file and publishing that to your Git web repository. That's something that some developers do as well. But usually what we see is whenever a developer needs a piece of infrastructure, they require to the platform team and to the, to the platform and the operation team. And usually, most of the applications to run on Kubernetes, they will require what? A piece of infrastructure. If we're talking about EKS, for example, because we're from Amazon, so we need IAM roles to give permissions to my applications. The same thing is true for any other cloud provider, you want to say. So for one team, it's fine. And even if that team in the middle, the infrastructure and operations team, even if they are using open to four Terraform, what happens when another team comes in? And another one, and another one. And another one, and another one, and another one. I probably, I'm seeing some laughs here and there, probably already saw yourself in this specific situation here. And this is what, why? People don't scale. People don't scale. What scale is artifacts and blueprints and empowering the developers to consume those blueprints. So for one team is fine, for multiple teams can be harder. So what we need to do actually is try to strike the balance between autonomy and standardization. Right, and it's pretty hard to do that. It's not a walk in the park. It needs various like iterational cycles until we get in a point that we like. And usually we see, for example, a graph, we can plot in a graph and we see that start startups are there, so they have full autonomy. Maybe the developers can do whatever they wanna do. They can provision infrastructure in the way that they wanna provision, but they don't have a lot of standardization because maybe the company is just starting. The other side, we have a highly regulated enterprise, like a big bank, for example, right? Where the standardization really, really matters, right? Most of you maybe are here in the middle. You have some sort of automation, you have some sort of standardization, but maybe the developers are not so empowered. Actually, where we wanna be is here with platform engineering. We want to empower the developers, but at the same time, maintain consistency and standardization of our environments. And Lucas, how can we overcome these challenges now? I think you explained well how, what the challenge is, but yeah, what yeah, can yeah. we do? No, that's it, guys. For, no, I'm just kidding. So how can we overcome this challenge? I will, I, I will answer in a very simple question for you, Tiago. In this slide, you can see that usually the infrastructure and operations team is not only responsible for infrastructure as a code. When we are talking about infrastructure as a code, we're talking about observability, security, IEC. How many of you are DevOps here? Raise your hands. <laughs> Most part of you are DevOps. So, how can we overcome this challenge, Thiago? We just shift to left. That's it. Is that a good idea? 
No, no, no. So what's going to happen right now is basically we have all the code bases, but the application development team one is using GitOps. The second one, they are using Gen AI Ops. We're waiting for that, right? And the, the other one, they are using ClickOps. They're going to the console and creating. Some of them are using CloudWatch. Some of them are using Grafana. But what is the problem of doing that? Maybe the application development team one is developing something that could be used by other teams as well. Right, and the, 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 team, the team three could be doing the same thing. Maybe they're developing some patterns on open to food to create an SQSQ, for example, and that could be reused. So if we just shift left, a wild west can happen because all the developers are gonna start to do whatever they want to do. So how can we really overcome this challenge? It's by creating blueprints. When I say blueprints can be a very heavy loaded term nowadays, I would say, templates or blueprints. But the idea here is that we create those application infrastructure blueprints, we give those application infrastructure blueprints to developers, and they, they will consume those blueprints and start to develop and deploy on top of it, right? And it's not so easy. So. I just have a question for you, Tiago. Now that we explained the problem, we understood that we can solve that with blueprints. How those blueprints look like, bro? Let's try to explore that. Please. But before we go into the blueprints itself, I think it's important to also discuss how an application is normally built on top of, it, of a Kubernetes cluster. You have a few objects normally. You don't have just a deployment on which you specify the container image on a, and how the application needs to be deployed. Multiple times you have an HPA on specifying how to scale this application, an ingress or a service to specify how to route traffic to this application, a config map for configuration, for example. And the same set of objects are normally required for each application that you develop. So what happens here if you don't have standardization? Exactly what Lucas mentioned to us. So your operational efficiency probably will get hurt by that because if you have many different ways to deploy the applications, you can also have many different issues happening in your, in your environment. So it's important to really standardize so that you can have a better operational efficiency. And a way to do that in Kubernetes is using Helm. Helm charts are very well known. You can pack all the Kubernetes objects into a single Helm chart and have this in a consistent way being deployed by your customers or by your uh, development teams. Let's take an example. Let's take a three-tier application. You might have multiple developer teams that need to deploy a three-tier app. What you can do is having those developers deploying the, this application using the Helm chart, creating a Helm release. They specify in the values that YAML of the Helm chart to customize to their needs. So the three-tier application, they specify, for example, if they want to use which container image for the backend, what is the scaling policy that they have to have, and so on. And another developer team would do the same configuring to their use case and so on. I would like to ask you all if you already had to do a cluster upgrade before. Please raise your hands and keep your hands up. Who have challenges in doing cluster upgrades in the past or are still having challenges? One of the main challenges is exactly what, because of what Tiago said, the, the objects are spread out and most of the times what really hurts when we're doing upgrades is API version changes, both for add-ons and applications. So a Helm shard? Yes, exactly, because API versions, they get deprecated after some time. If you don't have a way to standardize how this is being applied, you might have to change this in multiple places. I was talking to a customer a few weeks ago, and they wanted to change, for example, from one ingress, like Nginx ingress, to the AWS load balancer uh, ingress. And they didn't know how to do this in scale because they were applying all the manifests with kubectl apply. And they had multiple applications that they had to do this manually, changing all the applications to change to the other load balancer. If they were to use Helm charts, they just would create a new version of the Helm chart and ask the developers, for example, to change to the new version of the Helm chart, making it way easier. But we're just talking about applications now. This is an open to full session. We are here to talk about infrastructure as well. Can we provision infrastructure with this pattern too? That's an important question. Mm, it seems it, that we have trained at that. Yeah, looks like that. And it's important because when we talk about, for example, microservices, that is a common use case of Kubernetes, of containers, you normally want to decouple the communication. You want to have, for example, an async communication between your microservices. How can you do that? With a queue, for example. Or you have persistent data. You also have to persist that in some place, for example, a database. So infrastructure related to the application is always very important. And there are a few ways to deploy this infrastructure. 
For example, a descriptive way, where you define how this application will be, this infrastructure will be created using, for example, HL, JSON, or YAML, for example, with OpenTofu, CloudFormation, and so on. You could do this with code as well, in a programming language, like, for example, in Python, in Java, and so on, defining with a logic structure how this infrastructure will be provisioned. And also more recently, there are some controllers for Kubernetes, for example, Crossplane or ACK, on which you can define the infrastructure using objects inside of Kubernetes. For example, you have an object called bucket inside of your Kubernetes cluster that the controller identifies that object and creates an S3 bucket, for example, for you or a bucket in your cloud provider. So it's a way also to provision the infrastructure. But for today's sessions, as you might already imagine, we will focus on Tofu. And why? Because we know most customers or multiple customers or companies already have written infrastructures of code in Terraform or in Open Tofu, for example. So we would like to bring an alternative on how to package the infrastructure with the infrastructure of code that they already have together with the application and apply this from within the Kubernetes cluster. So, but it's also important to mention that independently on which tool you use, it could you be using Crossplane and any other tool, for example, as well, this same concept applies. So you will have the base resources, like for example, an S3 bucket, and an IAM role. You could have, for example, a DynamoDB table and so on. The idea is that you don't expose those resources directly to the developers. Why? Because you can create the blueprints on top of it and have all the best practices of your blueprints or, uh, packaged in those models. Let's take an example, S3 list privilege. You can create an S3 bucket and an IAM role and give access just to that S3 bucket that you just created with only the privileges rec required. So when your developer creates an S3 bucket, they already create based on these best practices of your company. But it, you can also have modules of modules or aggregated modules. And a use case would be, for example, at the application level. Let's take the three-tier app again. Probably it has not just one infrastructure resource. You can have, for example, a table and a queue, as we mentioned before. So you can also aggregate together multiple infrastructure resources at the application level and aggregating models, for example. In Crossplane, uh, in Crossplane, this would be, for example, compositions of compositions. This applies to any technology. Cloud formation would be nested stacks. And the yeah. same thing applies for home charts, right? Instead of copy and paste, Terraform are open to full code across all the repositories. We're centralizing models and making that available for our developers. But Tiago, we, we mentioned about like structures of Helm shards and structures of open to full models, but can we apply that from within our cluster? Yes, I think there are a few ways we could do this. We could, for example, create a different CI-CD pipeline just to apply infrastructure. But as you asked, I think it's important to have this package together because we are not talking about base infrastructure, we are talking about infrastructure for the application. So one way to do that is using the Tofu controller. Open Tofu controller is a controller from Flux, and it enables you to apply Terraform or Open Tofu code from within of your Kubernetes cluster. So how it works is you create, it creates a new uh, custom resource inside of your Kubernetes cluster, so you can create new kind of objects. When you create such an object in your Kubernetes cluster, the controller will run a TF runner that will apply your open tofu module, creating the infrastructure and saving the TF state, for example, in a Kubernetes secret in the namespace that you had is running. So this is a way for you to apply it from within Kubernetes as well. And one thing that I want to mention here is you don't need to auto apply using open tofu. You can create a pipeline to manual approve depending on what is changing, what you're applying, and then you deploy that stuff. All right, so we have the open tofu controller, we have the Helm shards, we have the open tofu modules for infrastructure. Now we need to put this all together for big the deploy one, I guess, yeah. right? So, uh, please move forward. Yeah, uh, uh, just to you to have an idea on how these objects look like, you will have just a new object inside of your Kubernetes, and that object does not have the Open Tofu code itself. That's important to mention. It's just a pointer to your Open Tofu module. So you have your Open Tofu module already defined as before. You could use any Open Tofu modules that you already had and was using before outside of Kubernetes as well, and now just point to them and use them within your Kubernetes cluster. And because we are talking about a new Kubernetes object, what happens is, that we can package this in our Helm chart. So now let's take that same example again, the three-tier application. Now we can package 
both application and infrastructure in the same Helm chart. And the developers can again provision that with your app using this Helm chart and specifying to their needs, for example, which database they want to use or what is the configuration of their databases and application and so on. Putting everything together in a more conceptual way, I think it's important to understand that, let's move forward. This would be, for example, the responsibility of the platform team, but that depends a lot on the company size. Some companies don't have a platform team, for example. This could be the DevOps team, the SRE team. But normally, if you have a platform team in your company, that is the responsibility of the platform team to create those blueprints. So they create the blueprint on how those open tofu modules will look like to provision infrastructure. They create the blueprint on the Helm charts on how the application will be provisioned. And there's an important part, as you can see, there is a link inside of the Helm chart that you point to your open tofu module so that you can package everything together. And now your developers can use those blueprints and provision their application, creating Helm releases, deploying both application and infrastructure. And the good part about this is that you can package into those blueprints all the best practices around observability. For example, the collectors on how to collect logs, metrics, and uh, traces, for example, of your application, all the security best practices that are required by your company, all the governance that really is required by your company, and the developers, when they use those blueprints, they, can already, they are already using following those best practices. And you still give the autonomy to the developers to provision the infrastructure for the application as they require. I think that's a very important part. And now you have a standard way as well to make developers become champions within your company to help you out to develop those, bl those blueprints as well. Because yeah. it's super hard to say to them, hey, help me on Terraform, but you don't give any guidance to them. What are you expecting like, for them to do? Like, just develop the code out of their mind? We need to create some pattern, and then they would develop on top of that pattern, and then the entire platform would benefit from that same pattern. And I think that's a very important point, because we heard from a few people like, OK, now the platform team can become a bottleneck as well. I don't have just three tier applications with my company. I have other patterns as well. So what was, Lucas was explaining is that you probably don't have so many different kind of applications. You have a subset of blueprints probably that you will require. And also, you can have your developers uh, also developing those blueprints for you. Adopting an inner search strategy, for, for example, within your company, where the developers also create those blueprints, they pass to the platform team, the platform team validates if it follows company's best practices, make it available in a catalog, that developer team and other developer teams can now use it. And you have a collaborative way to scale it, as Lucas was mentioned. All right. And, all right. We talked about how to create those blueprints in a more conceptual way. But it's not just about having the consistency within the blueprints. It's also on how we apply those blueprints and the updates to these blueprints and applications. Lucas, can you cover, please, how we can do that with GitOps? Sure. So GitOps to the rescue. So for those who don't know what GitOps is, GitOps is a way, it's a deployment pattern where we have the repository becoming the single source of truth, and whatever we have pushed it to the repository, we have that reflected within our cluster. And the other way around is true as well. So whatever we change in our cluster, if we have declared, declared in the SM repository, that will reflect back again to what we have in the repository. And this is what we call a mutability firewall because nothing gets deployed in my cluster if it's not from my Git repository, my SCM repository. So with that, we have traceability. We can see, we can revert commit. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good thing to use. And in this solution, and we're gonna showcase for you folks the QR code in a second, we're using Flux to integrate with open to full controller. You wanna add something? Yes, and I think it's important to mention, as, as you already mentioned, but it's important to reinforce, GitOps is not a tool. GitOps is a concept on how you reconcile using the Git to really apply the changes in your Kubernetes cluster. And it's there good. are a few tools for GitOps, and we are using Flux. Argo CD, for example, is another, but that's important that both tools, they implement this concept of GitOps, but GitOps itself is not a tool. And why GitOps is super good? Because basically every controller in Kubernetes works in the way that the GitOps controllers will work. So we have, for example, we created a deployment set, and we created a deployment manifest, that deployment manifest will get pushed uh, to the API server, then the metadata will be persisted on the ETCD, and then we'll be up to the deployment controller to guarantee that whatever we have declared on the ETCD is reflected in our cluster. So the same thing is true for that GitOps pattern here. So how this workflow looks like, and we have a solution that we implemented 
using all these tools that we are showing, showing to you folks today. So we have the OpenTOEFL module in one side, just one example of a module that we created for that three-tier web application that Tiago was mentioning. Then we bring the applications, their Helm releases, to our SCM repository. Once the their Helm releases or the manifest, whatever you have published on that repository is there, it's not up to any it's not up to for it's up to the GitOps tool to then reconcile whatever you have declared in your Git repository and then deploy that in your cluster. So in this case, we're using Flux. Flux will use Helm controller to provision the Helm shards and open to full controller to provision the application infrastructure. And then as Tiago was mentioning, we'll persist the state and the Terraform plan as secrets on the namespace that it's executing. But in our two, we cover also the automation interface. So since we are just, the deployment component of this solution is Flux, right? Argo or Backstage or even Jenkins could be used only to push templates to repository. Once the template's there, it's not up to Jenkins, Argo, workflows or Backstage anymore to do it. It will be up to the controllers to reconcile whatever we have declared in our open tool model, in our Helm charts, because this is where we define the business logic and this is where we define how applications are gonna get deployed into our cluster. And then once they push it, it's up to the controller to reconcile. So our workflows and even backstage and even Jenkins in this tool is just being used to create templates and push to our repository. After that, it's up to the controllers to do their jobs. But also using Helm shards and infrastructure as a code and modules in the way that we are showing to you folks today can be also good for SaaS companies who have that tier strategy on them that need to change the way that tenants are deployed in Kubernetes clusters. So Tiago, can you cover that for us? Sure. And I think it's important to mention that SaaS tiers, they at the end are a business needs of your company. You could, for example, identify that you have a group of customers that have a compliance need that have to have a dedicated environment, for example. You have another group of customers that don't need all the features of your application, but they would like to pay less for your application, and so on and so forth. And you can map those customer needs to tiers on your applications. Here we have just three as an example. The basic tier is a shared environment, so all the tenants, they share the same environment, all the customers share the same environment. Advanced tier, it's part shared and part dedicated, and premium is a dedicated environment for each tenant. And we can map this very well to that Helm chart strategy that we just mentioned, because what we have is the Helm chart defines the application, all the microservices required for our application, all the infrastructure pieces for that microservices as well using OpenTOFU. And what we do is basically create a new tenant, a new Helm release that identifies that tenant, just specifying the values to, to what we want to enable or not, for example, for that tenant. So for the basic tenant, we just disable the creation of all microservices and infrastructure. For the premium, we enable everything and deploy a new environment for each tenant, for example. And as Lucas already mentioned, Flux will come into the play here. We'll see that we have a new object inside or a new file inside of our Git. We'll provision this reconciling and creating the both application and infrastructure. For sake of time, we won't be able like, to go into all the details on how this infrastructure or this uh, reference architecture works here, but we have a reference to it here if you want to. There is a GitHub repository with all the code. We also have a workshop that we built that is a two-hour session workshop. If you want to go into all the steps and more details on how to onboard tenants, offboard tenants, apply updates, both automatically to all of your tenants at once or even in waves, for example, I have first the beta tester customers that they want to apply an update and afterwards to the others, for example. And if by any chance you are going to reinvent this year, we'll be, be having also a session there, a two-hour session that we can go into more details. I would please ask you all also to fill the survey. It's very important to have your feedback. If you liked or didn't like as well, please let us know. And I think we have just 40 seconds for questions. And with that, we thank you all. And I think we can. Can we take 42 seconds for questions? Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? There's, there's a microphone, I think, there. I don't know if there are microphones in the room. Hey, y'all. Uh, it's cool to see the OpenTOEFL controller continue to move on after WeaveWorks. 
is AWS involved in the project? I'm, I'm surprised to see AWS talking about it, using it. Um, I think that's great, but I'm interested in the future of the project. Are you guys contributing? Are you, is AWS a sponsor? So we have seen many customers having a uh, requirement of deploying Terraform code from within their clusters. And I've seen many people doing different things. AWS is not directly involved with OpenTofu, but we as Solutions Architect, are, are since we support our customer use cases with POX, demos, and, POC, and POCs, we do we have created this pattern and architecture to support a community and a problem that we saw that many of our customers were having because before it was like, I already have all the Terraform code, but I want to apply from within my cluster. Okay, move to Crossplane, right? So now we have a different thing that many people like still use Terraform. So because of that, we are involved, but AWS specifically is not involved, but we are. Gotcha, that makes sense. Thank you. And I think that's it. Our LinkedIn's are there. Thank you so much, folks, for our time today. We really appreciate it. We can catch up uh, outside if you want to talk more. Thank you. Thank you.